Okay, hello, welcome back to the, my uh, wood shop. Uh, this project, what we're going to do is we're going to do a uh, series of candle holders, a uh, bit of a slim type of design, a little bit um, uh, something exotic looking. Uh, what we're going to need for the project, uh, I guess we'll start from, from this side and work our way over. Uh, you need some sandpaper uh, for a little bit of sanding. Uh, you're going to need the, the pattern, obviously. The pattern consists of a tall leg, medium leg, short leg, and the blocks. Uh, one to hold the actual candle, the other one will be a stabilizer uh, for the bottom portion of the legs here. Uh, you're going to need four of each one. Now, if you're going to decide to follow this pattern or do your own design or whatever, it doesn't matter, but you're going to need four, because one, two, three, four for each one. So, four tall ones, four mediums, four smalls, and you'll need six blocks, uh, because one for the top and one for the stabilizer. Three of them are going to need to have this hole drilled out. Uh, three of them will not, because the candle is not supposed to go through the block. Uh, it's also a safety thing, fire hazard, obviously. So, uh, as far as this here, the pattern for the tall leg, in order to get this on uh, a piece of wood to be cut out, you'll need a piece of wood that is at least an inch and a quarter wide, and so that you're not really playing with any uh, uh, rough edges or whatever. Uh, you might want to go a little bit wider than that, just to make life a little easier for you. Uh, but, inch and a quarter wide, seven inches tall for the tall leg pattern here. The medium leg, again, inch and a quarter by five inches. And for the short leg, if you want to do all three, the short leg is going to be three inches high and again, one and a quarter inches wide. The legs need to be a quarter inch in thickness because they're going to mate into these quarter inch notches that will be made in the blocks. Again, you need six. You're going to need a seven eighths inch a uh, bit to make the hole, and the hole needs to be a half of an inch deep, centered. Uh, and again here, it's a quarter inch groove deep, quarter inch wide, so quarter inch by quarter inch. The blocks on this pattern here are one and seven eighths of an inch wide and long. So it's, it's square, obviously. Um, there's the pattern there, if you want to kind of jot some notes down. Um, other than that, uh, that's pretty much it that you're going to need to know as far as the pattern is concerned. Um, for the project, what you're going to need is either to mark your centers and stuff. You can either use a scratch awl or you can use, uh, if you have a gimlet, these are uh, available at Lee Valley. They're relatively inexpensive and they're pretty neat. They're, they're quite handy. They do a good job starting holes, like a little bit of a hand drilling uh, to get uh, starter holes going, especially useful if you're using uh, something like this because it's got that little bit of a tip on it so it helps get that tip into the hole and then it's easier to get this thing started. This is your 7 8 inch bit, this is the one that I'm going to be using. You can use a drill bit if you want, it doesn't matter. Uh, don't really recommend you use a spade bit, those things are pretty brutal, they tear up the wood really good. These things will too. You have to make sure that you set your drill press speed to the proper speed for the drill bit that you're using. I always keep mine on a slow speed anyways, uh, even when uh, I do spindle sanding and stuff like that. If you saw some of my other videos there, the uh, bandsaw boxes that I made, uh, you've seen my drill press in action there. It doesn't run at a very fast speed. I think it runs somewhere in the area of six, six, seven hundred RPM. Uh, if you want, you can use a marking knife. If you don't want to use a sharp pencil, it doesn't matter. Whatever is more comfortable for you. Uh, pencil, pencil sharpener, they're always overlooked. Uh, you'll need scissors to cut the pattern out. Uh, I've got a six inch ruler here uh, that I use. You're not going to need too much more than that because we're not working with big wood, so I don't need my big combination square. Uh, just a little square to check for flatness of your wood and check your square. Uh, I use this little four and three quarter inch uh, machinist square here. Um, I'm going to be cutting out patterns and putting them onto hardboard. That's uh, this stuff here. Uh, I got this scrap cut off. Uh, it was two dollars at, uh, where did I get this from? I think I got this from uh, Arona or whatever. Uh, Rona, Home Depot, Lowe's, they have like a cutoffs bin that you can go in the lumber section. Sometimes you see these things. So 
Uh, I picked up a few of these. They make good for templates. And uh, if you've seen some of my other videos, you've seen uh, you'll you'll see it again on my drill press. It, uh, make my table a little bit bigger than what's available with my drill press. I also used some of this uh, for a zero clearance. Uh, table for both my scroll saw and for my band saw uh, makes cutting small pieces easier and safer um, yeah and it's, it's a cheap fix you don't have to go and get the inserts and all that stuff and uh, it increases my table size as well which is pretty neat um, what else what else what else I'm gonna be using stuff for the finishing oh your spray adhesive sorry you're gonna need the spray adhesive I spray the pattern put the pattern onto my template or you can do it straight to your wood if you want, if, you, if you're only going to make one or two. Uh, but I plan on making uh, several of these, especially when I do the teaching uh, for my woodworking teaching classes. Um, your woods that you're going to choose, I'm using red oak and ipe. Uh, ipe is this brown, heavy, heavy, dense wood. Uh, some people use it for decking and stuff like that, and woodworkers use it for other stuff as well, uh, projects in this case. Uh, it's going to make the legs. Uh, the ipe will make for the legs, and the red oak is going to make for my blocks. Um, you can use whatever woods you want to use. Um, aromatic cedar, you can get away with something like that. I don't really recommend it, but uh, you can use whatever you want. Uh, let's see, what else, what else, what else am I missing? Uh, the sandpaper we went over, the spray adhesive, the glue. I'm using this uh, cyanoacrylate super glue, uh, crazy glue, whatever you want to call it. Um, because I figured if I'm going to use like yellow glue, like, uh, you know, whatever, the Lee Valley yellow glue or the tight bond or even white glue, it with the squeeze out that's going to happen uh, between here and the legs and stuff, it's going to be a little bit difficult to get in there to sand. You might have to end up using a chisel and it just might start marring the wood and scratching it up and making gouge marks. It's just going to be brutal and hideous. So a drop of this will go a much longer and better uh, way than using yellow glues. Um, you see the walnut oil, you think I have uh, some kind of... Uh, stock uh, shareholders uh, stake or something in this stuff but I prefer the walnut oil over boiled linseed oil uh, it's also a little bit safer to use I don't have to worry about uh, spontaneous combustion if uh, you know I have a brain fart or something and forget about my rag and leave it off in the corner and then I have a shop fire <laughs> nobody needs that uh, once that's done, once I get the oil on, uh, you've seen this as well if you watched my bandsaw box videos. I heat the oil up in this. I put this on the hot plate of my coffee machine sitting over there uh, to warm up the oil. Because like I've said before in my other videos, hot oil uh, gets into the pores and spreads better and e easier than a cold oil. Now, don't get me wrong, a cold oil is going to spread and get into the pores too. But a hot oil just tends to get deeper into the wood uh, for whatever reason. Once that's cured out and, and dried, then I'm going to pretty much finish it with this uh, polyurethane spray. It's a clear satin. It's not gloss. Uh, I don't want something high gloss on this. A satin is going to look really nice. So uh, I'm just going to hit it with a spray of this. Now, you might be looking at this and saying, why am I going to talk about this? But this is critical if you're going to use this. If you've ever used especially this brand of spray adhesive. When you get this stuff on your fingers, acetone won't get it off. Soap and water doesn't get it off. This stuff actually does work. Um, you know, I had another kind of a, you know, glue uh, sticky remover or whatever. It didn't work, but this stuff, it works. It really does. So after you use this, uh, then soap and water and your hands are completely free of any adhesive residue. So that's pretty much it. I think I talked about everything I can as far as what this project is going to need. Uh, I talked about my drill press and all that fun stuff. So that's pretty much all we're, we're going to uh, need to use here. So uh, I'm going to get my uh, patterns cut out. I'm going to do multiple patterns um, because uh, when I teach, I'm going to need more than, than one set because uh, otherwise I'm going to have kids hanging around waiting for someone to finish using it and it'll take a lot of abuse. So I'll cut out several of them and then go from there. But for this one, we're just, uh, we'll make one and then we'll use that pattern over and over again on the wood. So I'm going to get this all set up. I'm going to turn the camera off for a minute, but for you, it's only going to be a second or two. So I'll get set up and I'll be back in a moment. Stick around. 
All right, so our patterns for our candle holders to be cut out uh, for our templates have been glued on to this hardboard here. There's this little thin hardboard. And we're going to get set up here with the bandsaw. We're going to start cutting these out so we can get on to the next process. Okay, so I've got my uh, little zero clearance makeshift table back on here. So uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to start cutting these pieces individually out now. Uh, so this will take a little bit of time. Uh, we'll go through maybe one or two cuts together and then uh, I'll shut the camera off and then we'll continue after I finish cutting everything. So I'm going to get my uh, dust collector turned back on, uh, make a little noise and uh, get this cutting process started up again. So. Here we go.
I am doing is extremely dangerous. Do not copy what I do. That's the little safety disclaimer for you. Alright, that one's pretty good there. So now all we gotta do is get our notches taken care of. What you just saw me do was cut out this pattern here and this is the seven inch leg portion here. I'm going to actually have to zoom out here because that camera's a little too far in. I keep always doing that the wrong way. All right, so as you can see here, I got the seven inch portion cut out with the notches. And uh, now this will be a template that will pretty much last hopefully forever unless something goes way wrong. It requires very, very little uh, in the way of uh, any kind of modification or sanding only because I was pretty close to my lines there. I got it pretty pretty good. So, uh, as a safety note, uh, please do not imitate what I did there doing this freehand. Uh, if you don't have the confidence uh, in your bandsaw skills or you're unsure or you haven't uh, got much experience with a bandsaw, please do not do freehand that close to the blade like what I did. Uh, I have experience with the bandsaw, I have confidence in my blade and my skill, and the most critical thing is to always know where your fingers and hands are uh, in relation to where that blade is, and to not make any sudden moves or jerk, or jerk the workpiece around, and to go very, very slow. And good lighting uh, is also important. Even though I got 18 shop lights in my, in my, uh, in my little shop here, uh, I still carry this magnifying lamp pretty much where I go for some extra lighting also for the camera but in this instance for uh, getting the cut as good as I got it here so I'm gonna cut the rest of them uh, when we come back you'll see all the cut pieces have been cut out and then we'll continue on to the next step from there and we'll continue with this candle holder project so be back uh, well for you it'll be a couple seconds for me it's gonna be a little while so stick around alrighty like I said uh, it took me a while to do but I got my templates done. Uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my uh, red oak, which is uh, right here, and I'm going to rip it down, uh, kind of like a like a resaw on the bandsaw, uh, to get the um, the thickness that I'm going to need uh, for these, which uh, is going to be sitting like that, and they need to be five eighths of an inch. So I'm going to resaw this on the bandsaw, then we'll take it over to the thickness planer to clean it up, and then we'll go from there. So let's go get that process started. 
All right, we got our red oak. Everything's all set up to go. Uh, the fence is set. To give me that measurement that I need. I'm going to turn on my uh, dust collector, and we're going to get this piece taken care of, and then it's over to the thickness planer. So here we go. So not too shabby if I do say so myself, pretty good clean cut. Next time I think I will switch my blade over to at least a quarter inch or something. Alright, so I'm going to take this over to the thickness planer. We're going to uh, plane it down to our final thickness that we're going to need. Stick around. Okay, just before we start planing the wood uh, to our final thickness, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, using a planer. Uh, the planer blades, unlike a jointer, uh, sit on top and they rotate in more of like a clockwise fashion. So when you're planing the wood, if you have wood that has a grain, like this red oak here, if it's going in a clockwise fashion, if I was to put it in this way, you can see how the rotation is going to rip up these fibers and cause what's called the tear out. And it's going to be pretty miserable looking but if I turn this around to go this way like this for the most part for this first part here I'll get a little bit of tear out because of the nature of how the the grain is running but once I get past about this point here when this is turning in a clockwise fashion it's kind of like you know that old saying when you pet a cat you pet it the wrong way and you know it's all kind of rough you pet it the right way and it's nice and smooth well the same deal with the joiner and the planer now, with this going in the clockwise fashion, if I'm feeding it this way, yes, I'll get a little bit of probably tear out here, and in order to kind of combat that just a little bit, instead of feeding it straight into the thickness planer, I'll put it to a bit of an angle. So instead of putting it in straight like this, I'll probably put it in on a little bit of an angle to try to counteract as much tear out as I can. But once I get to here, that cutter head is going to be going with the grain so it's going to make it a smoother cut so we're going to get this set up I'm going to uh, fix the camera angle turn on my dust collector and we'll get this piece planed down so give me a second all right let's get this piece of wood thickness planed and don't forget your hearing protection it gets pretty loud you might want to turn your TV or computer down for this part So we got that to where we need it to be, that's 5 eighths of an inch. It might be just a shaving over, but that's fine. When we sand it, uh, it'll be pretty much where I need it to be. So now what we're going to end up doing is we're going to zoom this out. I'm going to take our piece here, which is sitting at, there it is, 5 eighths of an inch. And we're going to get ready with the next step. So. Give me a moment, we'll get set up. 